Thank you for checking out this video. Our prayer is, is that this video helps us fulfill our mission of helping those that are far from God become committed followers of Christ all the way from the scenic city to the nations. While we think that this uh, video is a blessing, we don't want it to be a replacement for church. We believe that the gathering together of saints and covenant community with other believers, other followers of Christ in a local body of believers in a church is what God created us and designed us to be, one body together. And so we pray this video will be a blessing to you. We pray it encourages you. We pray it challenges you, brings you closer to Jesus. But we don't want it to be a replacement for church. And so we encourage you to uh, go to a church that's close to you. And we would love for you to join us at Brainerd Baptist the next opportunity that you have. If we aren't careful, we're going to be accused of having church. That's a, a question for you. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony and bab being baptized today. It's a, that's, a, that's a big deal. And I'm thankful for it. I'm, if you are a guest here today, you've got a picture of what we're about at Brainerd Baptist Church. We, we are about the gospel. We're about helping those that are far from God commit to follow him all the way from the scenic city to the nations. We do that through the way that we worship and that we sing to him. We do that as we give public professions of faith like you saw this morning. We do that by sending our members all over the world, and we want you to be a part of that. And so if you have not become a member of Brainerd Baptist Church, I want to encourage you, there's not a better time to commit to follow and be a part of Brainerd Baptist Church than where we are today. And so I want to just encourage you to do that. We are in the book of Nehemiah. Uh, we have two sermons left in this book when we are going to cover today two chapters. Um, so uh, buckle up. We're going to move through those quickly. Before we get to the end of the book, though, I think there's some value in reminding ourselves of where uh, we started this book. And so I want to read to you just the first three verses in Nehemiah. The words of Nehemiah son of Hakaliah. During the month of Chislev in the 20th, 20th year, when I was in the fortress city of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, arrived with men from Judah. And I questioned them about Jerusalem and the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile. And they said to me, the remnant, these people in the province who survived the exile, are in great trouble and disgrace. Jerusalem's wall, it's been broken down, and its gates have been burned. As we started this book of Nehemiah, his questions about the state of the exiles, the state of Jerusalem, about the walls, the answers that he got from his brother, it started a series of storylines. The first storyline that it started was the storyline of these walls in Jerusalem and how they needed to be rebuilt. The next storyline was about the people who he said here they were, in, uh, they, they were in trouble and disgrace. The people, they needed God to revive them. And then there's this third storyline that runs through the book of Nehemiah. It's the story of Nehemiah and his part, how God uses an individual to do and accomplish his purposes and in these great things and rebuilding a city and reviving a people. But ultimately, these three storylines, they all come together to form a greater story. And that greater story is that God wanted to restore his witness to all the world. God desired to be known among all people. And the reason that he was so concerned about Jerusalem was that Jerusalem was to be his witness, both those walls and the people within those walls. Chapters 1 through 7 of Nehemiah, they focused primarily on rebuilding the actual walls of the city. And despite persecution, despite discouragement, despite a lack of resources, despite all of the difficult work, those walls were rebuilt. God's witness was restored through the rebuilding of walls. And then chapter 7 comes, and there's a turning point that happens in the book. While the walls had been rebuilt, Jerusalem was empty. The people that had come returned from exile. It's the few that were there, their lives didn't give witness to the God that they were supposed to be a witness to. God would have to revive their hearts. And he did that in chapters 7 through 10. The people heard God's word. 
God's word changed them. They began to obey God's word. They celebrated this festival of the shelters that we looked at. And then they returned to God after that time of celebration because they wanted to repent and confess their sin to God. They wanted to come into God's presence. And as they came into God's presence, they had a desire to obey Him. To, they wanted to honor Him. They wanted to uh, just do what He asked them to do, what He commanded them to do. God's witness was restored through the reviving of His people. And then last week, we looked at the people as they have come to the Lord. They've approached Him. They've confessed their sins. They've committed themselves, and they write that commitment down. They make a vow before all of the people of the city and before God Himself, that they will follow after Him, that they will honor Him. In today's passage, it's as if these three threads finally come together, each one at the end of the thread. And in chapters 11 and 12, which we'll look at today, it will be as if Nehemiah gets these threads and he ties them together in a nice little bow to conclude his book. What we'll see is is that we see that the walls are restored, restored walls, plus revived people equals a restored witness for the Lord. Our practical application for us as we walk out of here, the main point of our sermon is, is that God calls His church, He calls us to intentionally work together to advance His witness from the scenic city, from where we are, to the ends of the earth. God calls His church to intentionally work together to advance His witness from the scenic city to the nations. I want to go ahead and tell you how our sermon is going to be broken up as well. So uh, if you are taking notes, these will be the four points of our sermon today. God's witness is advanced when we show up. God's witness is advanced when we do something. God's witness is advanced when we make some noise together. And God's witness is, is advanced when we do our part on His mission together. So let's look at the first of those. God's witness is advanced when we show up. When we show up, look at chapter 11 of Nehemiah, and we're going to read the first four verses. Nehemiah writes, Now the leaders of the people stayed in Jerusalem, and the rest of the people cast lots for one out of ten to come and live in Jerusalem, the holy city, while the other nine-tenths remained in their towns. The people blessed all of the men who volunteered to live in Jerusalem. These are the heads of the province who stayed in Jerusalem, but In the villages of Judah, each lived lived on his own property in their towns, the Israelites, the priests, the Levites, the temple servants, and descendants of Solomon's servants, while some of the descendants of Judah and Benjamin settled in Jerusalem. As some of you uh, guys know, before I came to Brainerd, I worked with the International Mission Board, and part of my job, the focus of the way that I served there was focused on very large cities, huge populations, strategically important. And I had the blessing of doing that work and, and coming in contact with some of the most brilliant thinkers, both Christian and secular, that thought about cities. And it was conversations constantly of what is a city? What, what makes up a city? What makes a city important or maybe more important than another city? One of the things that was often talked about was what is a city? And we learned that we talked about a lot about cities, they're not primarily defined by their history. They're not primarily defined by the architecture, all the buildings that are in them. They're not primarily defined even by the the religion of the city or the governments of the city, by the economy of the city. All those things are important, but a city is ultimately defined by the people that live within the city. The people make up the city. And that's true today, and it is also as true today as it was in the book of Nehemiah. One of the few times that Jerusalem is referred to, you called it in verse number one of our passage today, as the holy city, and when it's the only time it's referred that way in the Old Testament, is found right here. And so it makes us ask the question, what makes, what makes Jerusalem holy? Well, it's primarily holy because of its principal resident, the one true God. The God who made his home, his dwelling place in that temple that we heard about being restored in Ezra. And now he was living among his chosen people. That one resident made that city holy. But Nehemiah, who was hoping to restore the city, he had a bigger problem. There weren't enough other residents in the city 
for the city to do and to be what it needed to be in order to honor that one primary resident who was, taking pre- who was living in the city. And so the leaders of the people of the Jews, they moved into Jerusalem. We heard that in these verses. Others basically drew straws. They cast lights to find out which of one out of ten would live and live in the city. They would move from their residence outside of the city to within the city walls. Now, among theologians and people that argue about these things, there are some of them that argue, well, what did it actually mean when we look in the passage that some volunteered? Well, basically, the best advance is that anybody who was willing to go live in that city was a volunteer, and the people blessed them. They thanked these others for going to live in the city. Here's the first reality of our passage. Jerusalem, it couldn't advance God's witness if the people didn't show up. If the people weren't present within the city, the city couldn't be what it was meant to be, what it was supposed to be. If they didn't move from where they lived and go to the place that God willed for them to be, to inhabit and repopulate the city, they couldn't fulfill God's will. You see, there's power in presence. Jerusalem couldn't advance God's witness without the presence of people within those rebuilt walls. Our church today, our church today can't advance our mission. We can't advance the witness of our Father if we don't show up, if we're not present here among each other. You know, the first aspect of missionary service, these people that we see on our screens every week, the reason that we see them on our screens is because their presence is elsewhere. They've taken the gospel, the witness of the Lord, and they've decided that they're going to live among those that need the light. Their light going into the darkness, their presence is one of the first aspects of their missionary service. For God's witness to be advanced, we have to show up. We have to be present in the places that God wants us to be present in. The mere presence of a follower of Jesus among those who don't follow Jesus should advance the gospel of the Lord. For God's witness to be advanced in your family, in your school, on your team, in your workplace, wherever it is that you go, He is counting on you to go be present in those places, to be a witness to Him in those places. He wants you to show up. That's true in evangelism, but it's also true in our church today. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 famously reminds us all that we're not to, we're not to neglect the gathering together of the saints. We aren't supposed, we are supposed to be committed to coming together at a time like this so that we can do what the preceding and the following verses call us to do, what our presence does when we gather together. The author of Hebrews, he says that when we're present together, it allows us to watch out for one another. It allows us to provoke love and good works among one another. It, encur- it, it, it allows us to encourage one another. Now, how does that happen on a Sunday in Chattanooga, Tennessee, when we come together at Brainerd Baptist Church, maybe meeting in this room? How do we do that? Well, our presence, our presence means that we're seen. Isn't that simple? You know, there are a lot of things that are hard and take a lot of effort, but Our presence just means that we show up. We get up, we get ready, we walk, we come to church, we walk in the door, we sit down, and even your presence sitting in these seats today can do these things. It helps us to be church together. It helps us to carry out our witness. Our presence is seen by others. If we're present, then others can come and minister to us. If we're present, others can come ask us to minister to us. To them. We can't do those things if we don't show up, if we're not present. When we see one another, we have the ability to provoke love and good works among one another. When we see each other, we have the ability to encourage one another, not just one another, just with our presence. You see, there are some people that are sitting in this room today, they're the only believer in their family. They're the only believer in their workplace. So the only chance that they have to sit among other believers is when they come to this place and they sit in these seats on a Sunday morning. A lot of us don't suffer that same problem. We have believers in our family who work with other believers, but there are those that don't, and it is a reminder for them every time that they come into this place that they're not alone, that they can keep going. 
that their presence, your presence encourages them with that. Brother and sister, never underestimate the value of the simple act of showing up. Showing up in your workplace. Showing up to worship with your brothers and sisters. When I was a teenager, I was about 14 years old in the church that I was in. Um, I, sang, I sang in the choir. They won't allow me to do that here at Brainerd. But I, I sang in the choir. I sat by a man that was a lot older than me. And uh, he lost his wife. And she passed away and he became a widow. And there was lots of questions in my mind about what that man was going to do the next Sunday. They sat in the same seat. It was only them. And I knew when that brother that I sat with in the choir, when he came and he sat down, he was going to be sitting down by himself. As a 14-year-old, I didn't really, I was looking for an excuse to not sit by my parents, and this was the golden opportunity. I wish that I could say that it was super holy, but there were ulterior motives in what I was doing. And so the next Sunday morning when we came down from choir, and that's what we did, kind of came down from the choir loft, I went and I sat by that older brother that was going to be sitting by himself. An amazing thing happened. We began to disciple each other, encourage one another, provoke each other to good works just because we sat by each other. We didn't say a lot, but I knew that every Sunday, if I wasn't there, that he knew that I wasn't there and he'd be looking for me. And he knew that every Sunday when he didn't show up, that I was going to be asking where he was. The simple act of showing up, of sitting down beside someone is an act and can be an act of discipleship. God's witness is advanced when we just show up. In the verses following, you'll find a long list of names. I'm not going to read all of those to you. The important thing that you need to know about all those names is that they're recorded where they're recorded because they decided to show up. They put their presence in the place that God wanted them to be. They moved into the city of Jerusalem. To live in the city of Jerusalem was a sacrifice. It meant that you gave up where you were, the things that you had, and you moved to a place that wasn't the same as the place that you were in. To live in Jerusalem was dangerous. To live in Jerusalem was like living on one of those border territories in risk, those territories that get changed hands over and over and over. And to live there, that's what it was like. People came in and conquered you. They went past those people in the countryside, and they came and they took over the city because they thought the money was in the city and the important people were in the city. They focused on the city. To live there was dangerous. But the people were faithful to go and to show up and to allow their presence to reside in the city. It's important to understand that these were real people. They left real property, real families, and they went to live in a real place. They were living, leaving those real resources. It cost them something to show up, just like it cost us something to show up today. That's why the people that didn't move blessed them. We see the names from three of the tribes of Israel in our passage, as we look at this list of names, there isn't a great deal of explanation of why there's only three tribes. It could be that uh, all the 12 tribes leaders were moved into the city when it talks about verse number one. It could be that all the tribes were represented, or it could be that there were just three. The main point that you need to understand here is that the people went and they made their presence known so that God's witness could be advanced where they were. Regardless, God's witness was advanced because the people showed up. God's witness is also advanced because of what we do. God's witness is advanced when we do something. As we look at the people and what they did, we'll recognize quickly that the actions they carry out aren't very extraordinary. When you work through these long lists of difficult to say names, there's a few points in in the list where you'll notice that it says one person did something or this other guy did something else. None of the things that they did were especially um, extraordinary. They were actually very ordinary things. In verse number six, we learn that some of the guys were apparently capable. You know, that's especially what you need in a city when you're trying to survive as people who are capable, capable of doing things, fixing things, doing things. They were capable people, not very extraordinary, just ordinary guys. Verse number nine of chapter 11 says that we learn that some of them were supervisors in their family. We read along and we see that among them were priests and that there was one of the priests who was chief official. He was the boss over all the other priests. 
They were the ones that did the work on the inside of the temple. They kept the temple up on the inside, and they also did the work of the temple. They were capable men as well. And while the priests did their work on the inside of the temple, there's this other group of people, the Levites, and they did all of the work on the outside of the temple. Ordinary stuff. They made sure the, the temple stayed up. They kept it clean. They kept the grounds up, we can imagine. While the priests did their work within the city, within the temple, the Levites did their work outside of the house of God. One of the priests was known as a prayer. He was a prayer warrior. We see him in verse number 17. There were also gatekeepers. These people that guarded the gates, they, they made sure that uh, people didn't come in and sell things on the Sabbath day. They made sure that the people who weren't supposed to come in didn't get in, and the people that weren't supposed to get out didn't get out. They watched the gate. Pretty ordinary thing. Chapter 12, we're given a list of people and how they came in as immigrants. All they did was show up. And they came in, the immigrants' first wave came with Zerubbabel, the second with Ezra, the third wave with Nehemiah. All of these are just ordinary things. This section of the passage concludes with the verses uh, 22 through 26 in chapter 12, if you just flip there really quick to me. It says, in the days of Eliashib, Joiada, Johanan, and Jadua, the heads of the families of the Levites, the priests were recorded while Darius the Persian ruled. And Levi's descendants, the family heads, were recorded in the book of historical events during the days of Johanan, son of Eliashib. The heads of the Levites, Hashaiba, Sherebiah, and Jeshua, son of Kedmiel, along with the relatives opposite them, they gave praise and thanks. Division by division, as David, the man of God, had prescribed as he had told them to. This included Mathaniah. Bakbukia, Obadiah, Meshulam, Talman, Akab were the gatekeepers. They guarded the storerooms and the city gates. These served in the days of Jehoiakim, son of Jeshua, son of Josadak, and in the days of Nehemiah, the governor, and Ezra, the priest, and the scribe. What's happening here? What sticks out in all of these names? What's happening among these people is that they were devoting themselves to do ordinary tasks. What they were supposed to be doing with their presence in the city. God's witnesses advance when God's people do something. When they do something. When we do something. It doesn't always have to be extraordinary acts of service to be important. Our church functions every single week because there are a number of people who do ordinary, maybe even what would seem as inconsequential things so that we can meet together and worship our Lord. Oftentimes they seem like things that are just small acts that don't really mean anything. Let's take walk through a day. On Wednesdays, let's imagine that there's a retired couple that comes and they pray weekly for our church and community. And we can imagine that because of their prayers that God answers and a, a young couple shows up in one of our services during the week. When they bring their kids to the service, they find that a senior adult has agreed to give one hour a month rocking a baby. That senior adult that does that, they're rocking the baby so that that young couple can come and sit in one of our services and listen to God's word be preached. There's someone probably who drives a golf cart up and down our hill here at Brainerd and so that young couple, they have a friendly conversation with that guy that drives them up and down the hill. There's another person who hands them a cup of coffee and gives them a smile, and they feel welcome when they come in. There's a band up here led mostly by volunteers who sing and play instruments as they lead that couple in worship. They walk into a life group where a business owner sacrificed his Friday night and Saturday morning to prepare a life group lesson. All of these seem like insignificant, inconsequential things. Even the lady who hands the young husband a towel as he baptizes his wife inconsequential, insignificant, ordinary things. But you see when they're stacked one on top of another, one after another, that God uses those inconsequential, ordinary things so that his witness is extended, so that people hear the gospel and they're saved. They give a public profession of faith like we saw this morning. It's important that God's people commit themselves not just to show up, but to do something. God's witnesses advance when we show up, when we do something, and when we make some noise. 
Look at uh, Nehemiah chapter 12, verses 27 through 43. There's some hard names, so forgive me as we uh, work through these. At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sent for the Levites, they were the singers, wherever they lived, and brought them to Jerusalem to celebrate the joyous dedication with thanksgiving and singing, accompanied by cymbals and harps and lyres. And the singers, they gathered from the region around Jerusalem, from the settlements of the Netophanites, I don't know how to spell, say that, from Beth Gagal and from the fields of Geba Asmaveth, for they had built settlements for themselves around Jerusalem. After the priests and the Levites had purified themselves, they purified the people, the city gates, and the wall. And then I, that's Nehemiah, then Nehemiah brought the leaders of Judah up on the top of the wall. And Nehemiah says, I appointed two large processions that gave thanks. One went on the right of the wall toward the dung gate. Hoshaiah and half the leaders of Judah followed, along with Azariah, Ezra, Meshulam, Judah, Benjamin, Shemaiah, Jeremiah, and some of the priests' sons with trumpets, and Zechariah, son of Jonathan, son of Shemaiah, son of Mataniah, son of Micaiah, son of Zachor, son of Asaph, they followed, as well as their relatives, Shemaiah, Azariah, Azarel, Melaliah, Galilee, Maiah, Nethanel, Judah, and Hananiah, with their musical instruments of David, the man of God. Ezra, the scribe, went in front of them, and at the Mount Fountain Gate, they climbed the steps of the city of David on the ascent of the wall and went above the house of David to the water gate on the east. Don't miss what's happening. This big group of people, they all went to the right. Verse number 38, the second Thanksgiving procession, they went to the left, and I, that's Nehemiah, followed it with half the people along the top of the wall past the tower of the ovens to the broad wall, above the Ephraim gate, and by the old gate, the fish gate, the tower of Hananel, the tower of the hundred, to the sheep gate. They stopped at the gate of the guard. Two thanksgiving processions stood in the house of God, and so did I and half the officials accompanying me, as well as the priest Eliakim, Mashaiah, Miniamon, Micaiah, Elionai, Zechariah, and Hananiah, with the trumpets, and Mas- Masaiah, Shemaiah, Eleazar, Uzi, Jehoahan, Malkijah, Elam, and Ezer. Then the singers sang with Jezariah as the leader. On that day, on that day, they offered great sacrifices, and they rejoiced because God had given them great joy. The women and the children, they also celebrated, and Jerusalem's rejoicing was heard far away. God's witness is advanced when we make some noise. Psalm 101 in the CSB says, let the whole earth shout triumphantly to God. If you memorize that verse in almost any other translation, it says, make a joyful noise unto God. The Lord, as the people dedicated the wall, they called for the band. They said, bring the cymbals, bring the harps, bring the lyres. This is a party. We are going to praise the Lord. Verse 36 says that they were the musical instruments of David. They prepared themselves for worship. They went and they purified themselves in the wall. and the, They followed all the rules that the law called for them to do. They, way, they wanted to be righteous vessels. As they sang, they wanted to make sure that the Lord heard their praise as they went around that wall. The people were ready. The people were excited. They were excited to worship the Lord and to give Him thanks, to make some noise for Him. And as the people showed up, to worship, they divided into these two groups. One group went to the right. Another group went to the left. Two giant parades walking around the top of the walls of God's city. Flashback. Do you remember what the walls of this city were like? Do you remember the news that Nehemiah heard about how they were just totally in rumble? Do you remember in chapter 2 when Nehemiah snuck out at night all by himself? 
God had laid on his heart what he was supposed to do, and he had an animal. And so he starts following the, the wall. Do you remember that it was so broken down he couldn't get on it, that he couldn't get hit the beast, whatever it was that he's riding on? It wouldn't even be held up by the wall. Do you remember that guy named Tobia who was mocking them the whole time? Do you remember how he made fun of them and how he said, even if a fox jumps up on that wall, that thing's coming down, and they laughed at him. Do you remember? I wonder if as Nehemiah led that parade around those walls, historians tell us it was probably nine feet wide at this point. I wonder if he remembered that dark night that night when he thought all was lost, that night when he wondered, how in the world, Lord, are you sure you're calling me to do this? I don't, do you see this wall, Lord? I wonder if he remembered that night. I wonder if the people remembered their prayer that they offered in chapter 2, where they said, Lord, strengthen our hands. You see, they didn't think they had the force anymore to do it. They didn't think that they had the resources to do it. They had these people making fun of them. They were under persecution. How are they going to do this? And they asked the Lord to strengthen their hands. Something tells me that Nehemiah remembered that night. Something tells me that those people, as they walked around the walls, that they had put stone after stone upon, it makes me think that they probably remembered what it was like putting those stones in place and what it looked like before God restored the wall. Something tells me that you didn't have to prod them on to sing a little louder. Something tells me that with every step that they took, their gratitude and their thanksgiving to the Lord, seeing what He had done through them, that it just bubbled up out of them, that God's witness was advanced, and they just couldn't hold in their joy. It wasn't just the guys. It was their wives. It was their children. Their kids had seen this wall go up, and they were ready to give the Lord thanks. They praised the Lord for what He had done. Just as the people in Nehemiah, we have reason to celebrate what the Lord has done among us. We've been redeemed today. We've been redeemed although our lives were destroyed by sin. Those rubbles of the wall, they represent it, represent what our lives look like before we knew Jesus and how He's come and He's rebuilt our walls if we know Him. We've been redeemed. We've been redeemed when we couldn't save ourselves. We've been redeemed. We've been redeemed when Satan mocked us and told us there's no way you can be saved. There's no way God will forgive you for what you've done. We've been redeemed. That should affect the way that we worship the Lord. It should mean that we come prepared, that we come into this place and we're excited and ready to sing. It should mean that we ask the Lord, Lord, would you forgive me, cleanse me of my sins so that the words that I sing to you, Lord, that you hear them and that they are beautiful to your ears. Redemption should cause you to remember what the Lord's done. Redemption should lead you to sing to him, should lead you to make a joyful noise to the Lord. Don't miss an important aspect of this parade. There's only one person in the audience as these people march around the city walls. They're singing praise. They're playing their instruments. But there's only one person in the audience. Do you know who that one person is? It's the one that makes the city holy. It's their one true God. Most parades that we watch today, they're all about all the people coming out and celebrating the people who are in the parade. But this parade is about the people in the parade celebrating the one one only God that is in their audience. They're worshiping Him. That's completely different than what we're used to. They make a joyful noise unto the Lord. As Psalm 100 says, listen to that psalm. It says, let the whole earth shout triumphantly to God. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we are His. His people 
the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name. For the Lord is good. His faithful love endures forever. His faithfulness through all generations. This whole worship thing, it's all about the audience of one. Our praise doesn't go to anyone else except to Him. That's what worship is all about. Verse number 43 says the people in the parade. It says on that day they offered great sacrifices. They rejoiced because God had given them great joy, the women and the children. They also celebrated Jerusalem's rejoicing was heard far away. Our worship today has an audience of one. When we gather in this place weekly, we sing not to each other, but to a one, the one true God. He deserves all the praise that we can give him and offer to him. Is that what we experience every time that we come? Does that... Does does that describe the way that we sing to him when we come and Molly leads us in worship? Do we sing like that? Do we have that type of joy as these people had? Do we act as if we have an audience of one? When the people, when we worship that way, the rejoicing, the rejoicing is heard far away. When a guest walks into our services, How do they describe the God that we're worshiping to? What does the way that we praise our Lord tell them about our God? Is He a God that we believe in? Is He a God that we're passionate about? Is He a God that saved us? Is He a God who continues to give us what we need to do what He's called us to do? Is that what our singing says? Is that what a stranger who walks into our service, our worship service, sees in us? Do we crave to sing His praise? Do we praise, does our praise give testimony of the genuine, authentic relationship that we have with our Lord? God's witnesses advance when we make a joyful noise to Him. And finally, God's witnesses advance when we do our part. Look at verses 44 through 47. On that same day, men were placed in charge of the rooms that housed the supplies, contributions, first fruits, and tents. The legally required portions for the priest and Levites were gathered from the village fields because Judah was grateful to the priests and the Levites who were serving. They performed the service of their God and the service of purification along with the singers and gatekeepers as David and his son Solomon had prescribed. For long ago in the days of David and Asaph, there were heads of the singers There were heads of the singers and songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. And so in the days of Zerubbabel and Nehemiah, all Israel Israel contributed the daily portions for the singers and the gatekeepers. They also set aside daily portions for the Levites, and the Levites set aside daily portions for Aaron's descendants. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 captures the heart of what's happening. Paul writes to the church in Corinth, he says, each person should do as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, since God loves a cheerful giver. The people in Nehemiah's day, those of us that are here today, were to give to the Lord with grateful hearts. The people that we see, the way that they give is important. They gave in a prescribed, planned, systematic way. There was a way that they were supposed to give. We heard a couple weeks ago, last week, I think, in chapter 10, we heard that they gave a tenth of what they made to the Lord. To give that way was a joy. It wasn't a burden. It's the idea of qualitative giving rather than quantitative giving. And there are those uh, among us today, when when I bring up the word and I say tithe, that we start to squirm. And there are those of us that when we squirm and we talk about a tithe, they're thankful that Dr. Curtis Hill will be preaching in two weeks. That idea of a tithe that exists in the New Testament, and they want to debate those type of people, none in here. They say, well, the tithe, it went away with the new covenant. Well, my response to that person is maybe. It may have gone away with the new covenant. 
But the tithe in the Old Testament is definitely a guiding principle. And to be honest, if there's an argument to be made against a tithe, the argument is this. That while we may be free from the tithe, every example of giving in the New Testament is well beyond a tithe. Do you remember the rich young ruler? Do you remember why he couldn't follow Jesus? Jesus said, you followed all my commands. Now, all you have to do is sell everything that you own and give it to the Lord. You see, Jesus wants it all. He wants all of your resources. He wants all of your time, and he wants to use it so that his witness will extend all the way from the scenic city to the nations. We have so much to be thankful for. To give to the Lord that saved us, redeemed us, changed us. It shouldn't be something that comes off like taxes, like something that we have to do. It should be something that we celebrate. We give to the Lord out of a grateful, thankful heart. We do our part so that God's witness will advance. You know, uh, here at Brainerd, just so that you know, we take up lots of offerings. You can probably name them. We give special missions offerings to the International Mission Board to the North American Mission Board. We give special offerings to the Tennessee Baptist Convention. We give offerings and benevolence that helps do all of these things. Even our normal giving, the normal giving that you drop in the blue box or you give online, our bylaws require that 10% of that money go to missions. They all go out so that we can have the, see the extension of God's kingdom. A couple months ago, there was an older guy who walked in to my office, and he had a question about this. And he said, uh, Kevin, I, I, I am on a fixed income, and I can't give a big offering. And uh, as we started talking, he said, the reason that I give, though, the way that I give is I give my heart is that I give in this systematic way. I give my little bit that I can give every single week. And the joy that I have is when I give that little bit every single week, that it stacks up, and I give more than I think I could give on a, in a year because I'm committed to give that little bit every single week in a systematic, planned way. It's that sort of commitment that allows us to give confidently. It's that sort of commitment that allows us to do more than we think that we can do. It's the reason that we pool our money together so that we can do more together than if we were separated. In Nehemiah, the city walls were rebuilt and the people were revived because, God, so because of that, God's witness was restored. This entire book of Nehemiah, every bit of it, is about restoring the witness of God in the walls and in the people so that the whole world might know Him. God's witness is advanced when we show up, when we do something, when we make some noise for Him, and when we do our part. Today, God's, God calls our church to intentionally work together to advance His witness from the scenic city to the nations. What binds us together is a mission a mission to help those that are far from God become committed followers of Jesus from the scenic city to the nations. That's why we show up. It's why we do something. It's why we make a joyful noise. It's why we do our part is because we believe in that mission, because we believe that that mission fulfills God's mission, that it makes His witness go out from where we are and that He can use that witness for His glory. Today, we're going to take the Lord's Supper in just a moment. I want to pray before we do that, and I want to remember, just as Corinthians teaches us, that we're to uh, consider where we are before the Lord. When we take the Lord's Supper like this, we're making a commitment that Jesus made. You see, Jesus, His commitment, it cost Him for his body to be broken and his blood to be spilt. And as we remember his sacrifice, we're also making our own commitment. We're offering that our body could be broken, that our blood could be spilt for his glory. So as we 
prepare to do this, I want to take just a moment and I want to ask you, have you committed that? Do you need to renew your commitment to show up, your commitment to do something, your commitment to give, your commitment to worship? Do you need to recommit in some way? I want to challenge you today to make sure that you're committed to all of those things before we take the Lord's Supper together. If you're not a follower of Jesus, I would encourage you to abstain from this cup and to take our Savior. The blood and the body that we're going to remember that was sacrificed, it was sacrificed for you. And all you have to do to know that Jesus, to take that Jesus, is to confess your sins and put your faith and trust in Him, committing to follow Him. Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you for who you are. We ask you, Father, that you would help us today to renew our commitment, a commitment, Lord, to show up, to be your witness where we are, to do something, even if it seems ordinary and inconsequential. Lord, we ask you to help us to recommit ourselves to worship you in a way, Lord, that draws all the attention of the world because we believe so much in you. Our gratefulness to you overflows. And Lord, we ask you, Lord, that you would allow us to do our part so that your glory might be spread through the nations. Lord, we ask you that you would help us to give to you, Lord, with with a grateful and a cheerful heart. Lord, allow us to follow the example of these followers of God that we see in the book of Nehemiah as they celebrate a rebuilt wall and a revived people. It's in your name we pray. Amen.